Okay, well, um, thank you to Paul and the committee for inviting me to speak today. And good afternoon. Um, and what I'd like to do in the next 40 minutes or so is to give you an overview of, of the treatments of, of tomorrow for Parkinson's. Starting with um, a reminder of what goes wrong with Parkinson's, um, looking at the, the, the shape of the clinical trials, the research studies, and then picking on two therapies in development which are of particular interest. Um, and obviously, as many questions as you want, um, the urgent ones as we go through or at the end. So, a bit of background first of all. Um, I'm originally a biochemist. I worked in research products with Amisham, head of R&D for diagnostics at Storono, um, and head of pharmaceutical R&D, health and personal care at Ricky Ben Kieser. Um, I was diagnosed with Parkinson's in 2012. Um, a couple of things to, to point out here. Towards the bottom of the screen, you'll see um, the brand Suboxone. Unusually for a company that, that um, predominates in consumer products, one of the legacies of, of a previous effort in pharmaceutical R&D was Suboxone, which was sold, buprenorphine was sold originally as a treatment for pain addiction. But it was developed and repurposed, as, as, as the phrase now is, into the, probably the world's best treatment for opiate addiction, um, whether legal or illegal opiates. Um, and the reason for mentioning this is that there's a lot of work going on in Parkinson's at the moment to take drugs that have been used in one indication, one treatment, and to prove one, one way or another that they have potential for, for, for Parkinson's. Um, the other point I should make is that I'm not a deep expert in the, the disease itself, you know, unlike your uh, you know, new, new, neurologist or the, the, or the researchers who work every day in neuroscience. Um, but thinking about some of the things I've worked on, if you have a stinking cold, if you have um, constipation, raging reflux, um, mouth ulcers, um, and you want desperately smooth legs, well, I might be able to help you in any, any of those areas. Uh, I'm also on the editorial board of the Journal of Parkinson's Disease and the Research Committee of the Cure Parkinson's Trust. So, what goes wrong with Parkinson's? I'm sure a lot of you will have heard of alpha-synuclein. This is a protein that has a normal job in the, in the brain and spinal cord, um, but in Parkinson's, something happens to make it clump together. So you go from the, the monomer, you see in the bottom left, which is just one copy of the, of, the, of the protein. It can then bind to, it, to itself, produce an oligon where you get two, three, four, five, sometimes more um, molecules of alpha you can binding together. And eventually you form these fibrils, these aggregates, which are insoluble, which clump together, and eventually form a major component of what's called Lewy bodies. Kevin, we're not seeing your screen. Ah. Bear with me. Ah, host disabled attendee screen sharing. Oh, sorry, let me, let me fix that straight away. Uh, security. <clears throat> I should be enabled. It says it's enabled. It is now. Excellent. Right, is that, could everybody see the screen now? Yeah. Paul? Yes, I've got it. Uh, uh, Michael, I've seen, uh, lovely. I've seen a couple of thumbs up. Thank you very much. So, just to yeah, quickly I'll repeat go. what I was saying is that um, the monomers, can aggregate eventually to these fibrils, which form the components of the bodies, which can block up the cell, basically. Um, now, the story is um, not completely uh, straightforward yet, because th there's, there's, a, there's still some debate over, over the role of alpha nuclear in Parkinson's, whether it's cause or consequence, but I think the majority of people uh, are moving on the side of cause. Also, in Parkinson's, 
the problems with mitochondria. The best way to think about mitochondria is these are the power stations of the cell. Um, and when they come to the end of their useful lifetime, they're reprocessed using the, the cells reprocessing machinery and the components are broken down and then reused. But there are two problems with mitochondria in Parkinson's. Firstly, they become in inefficient. So it's harder to produ produce energy and maybe one reason why we, we uh, encounter a lot of fatigue in Parkinson's. The second thing that happens is the process to break them down fall, falls apart so that dead mitochondria, dead power stations build up inside the cell. And you can imagine the kind of problem that would cause, which is also related to the problem that you get with lysosomes. The lysosome is the waste processing unit of the cell. It takes in rubbish and spits out stuff that can be reused. Um, so there are lots of enzymes that break down proteins and fats inside the lysosome. And again, they get clogged up. So if, if there's no room for things to be reprocessed in the lysosome because it's not working properly, then again, you'll get builds up inside the cell, which cause problems. The next thing that can go wrong is oxidative stress. So molecules called free radicals can actually damage the cell and, and eventually potentially kill it as well. So the cell has to deal with oxidative stress as well. And inflammation in, in the brain particularly, is another thing that's often seen in Parkinson's. Now, we don't know whether the inflammation starts the process of, of the neurons dying in, in Parkinson's or whether it's a consequence because the role of infl the inflammatory system, the immune system, is to uh, look out for problems and wherever there are problems, go and solve them. So unfortunately, when they see a, a neuron that's in trouble, they think there's a problem and so that the immune system bears down on the, the, new, the neurons and potentially can lead to, to, to the death of the neuron. Um, now, one of the questions is, what's the first part of the sequence? I think the genuine answer is, as yet, we don't know. We don't know whether it starts with mitochondria, with cytonuclein misfolding, with oxidative stress, with inflammation, but you can observe all of these phenomena within Parkinson's. So added to the problems that, that, that occur, um, developing drugs for central nervous system disorders is a pretty tough call. It takes an average of two and a half billion dollars to, to develop one successful drug. And that doesn't mean that that drug itself costs two and a half billion dollars, but in order to get one out of the, the back end of the pipeline, you need to put two and a half, two and a half billion dollars into the start of the pipeline with many thousands more molecules Obviously, lots of them will fall out along the way to get, so it's an average of two and a half billion dollars to get one on the market. It takes longer than the average pharmaceutical development, less than half as likely to succeed. And when you get towards the end, it takes a long, lot longer to get approval from the regulatory authorities. And those regulatory authorities will offer a priority review to neuroscience drugs a third less often than the average. So with that background, you might think, well, it, it, we, we don't stand a chance of, or much chance of getting resources within the pharmaceutical industry um, to develop drugs for Parkinson's. When you look at the top indications for pharmaceutical research and development, Parkinson's comes at number 17 in terms of the number of projects that, that are underway. So you might think, well, 17, that's not bad. But when you take out all of the cancer indications, the situation improves even more because it's fourth behind Alzheimer's, type 2 diabetes, and rheumatoid arthritis. Um, so it's, you can see just from this, it, it is quite a priority with the pharmaceutical industry. Which begs the question, why? Well, the prevalence is increasing. Um, a, couple of years, a few years ago, there was roughly 6 million people around the world with Parkinson's. And there are estimates that by 2040, there'll be 13 million of us around the world it's a chronic condition, which means it, it goes on for a long time. Um, and as you, as you all know, the drugs that are currently available to treat Parkinson's, look at the symptoms. We don't yet have a treatment that will modify the course of the disease. And so there's currently no cure. 
And I've put the word cure in inverted commas because a cure means different things to different people with Parkinson's. If you're very early in, in, in the development of the disease, in the early stages, perhaps you might not even start, have started medication yet. If a drug was available which stopped the progress of Parkinson's, that would be fantastic. And I think almost everybody in that particular situation would take it. If you're further down the line um, and you could stop, stop the uh, progress, Again, even even if you have certain um, sim a lot of classic Parkinson symptoms, you might still accept that. If you're at the later stages where you're perhaps in the infusion therapies, your mobility may may be uh, completely shot, then just to stop there would not necessarily constitute a cure. But if you could actually replace a lot of the functionality that you'd lost. That starts to become more attractive and more close to the definition of a cure. So I think it's important that we don't think of a cure as a magic bullet that solves the problem of Parkinson's for everybody. Because as we know, we're all different. There's a classic phrase which says, if you meet one person with Parkinson's, you've met one person with Parkinson's. So it, it's probably likely that there, there won't be a single magic bullet, but there's likely to be a, um, a portfolio of, of disease modifying drugs which attack Different, different symptoms in different areas where the pathology has, has started to become more applicable to a, a broader number of people. So when I was diagnosed in 2012, um, I used my scientific background to try to do more research into what was going on with Parkinson's and what treatments were um, under development. It then developed into a disorganized spreadsheet which I then reorganized and start, continued working on, and it eventually morphed into what I now call the Parkinson's Hope List, which um, the, the, this is the link to, to get to, to the spreadsheet. It's publicly available, anybody can look at it. Um, and I'll take, take you through some of the numbers in the Hope List in a moment. There's also another very good website run by a lady called Sue Buff and a guy called Gary Raffaloff in the US called pdtrialtracker.info which looks at all of the clinical trials for, for Parkinson's that, that, that are ongoing and organizes them into different groupings and very useful, uh, a very useful site if you're interested in clinical trials for Parkinson's. So the question now is how many Parkinson's therapies are in research and development? And normally if we, if, if we were meeting live, I ask for people to put their hands up, but I can't see everybody. So we'll just go with the floor here. Just for your own benefit, just think in your own head, how many, how many Parkinson's therapies do you think are in research and development? And when I reveal the number, which is at least 291, then think to yourself whether that's a surprise or not. Um, but it is, to me, it's still a very large number. And I put at least because th these are the ones I've been able to find. There may be some other projects underway in, other companies and institutions around the world that I haven't yet found. Um, and what a lot of people in the Parkinson's community like to do is to split them up into, does it, does it provide symptomatic relief? Or does it modify the course of the disease? And two ways to modify the course of the disease are to slow or stop the progress. And secondly, to replace what's been lost. And when you take that 291, those 291 projects, then you'll find that 112 of them are looking to relieve symptoms and 179 are looking to modify the course of the disease. There's a, when, when, when you split the pharmaceutical development process up into two, which is simplistically before it's injected into humans, it, before it's tested in humans and after it's tested in humans, then there's a, a bias towards the disease modifying area when so I'm trying to find my cursor when when you when you look at that that 179 um so mo most of those are in the pre-human stage um, and most of the re symptom relief is in the clinical trial stage and here is a list of the the numbers in each particular stage the further further down you, the program you get the closer you get to the pharmacy shelf. Um, 
we can see um, large numbers in preclinical and phase one. Phase one is the f first in human uh, part, where you, it's almost exclusively looking towards safety. Phase two is still looking at safety, but then starts to look at other areas of potential efficacy. And phase three is it has the balance much more in efficacy, but also a close eye on safety because phase three is where the larger numbers in trials happen. We have a bit of a problem in phase three because this, this is the, the last step in the process. It's the most expensive stage in the process. And there are 20 of the 291 programs are in phase three, but only two of them are potential disease modifiers. We'll be talking about exenatide later. And the other one is Lingji, which is an extract of a Chinese mushroom called Ganoderma. So we need a lot more flipping from phase two into phase three. Also, when you look at the academic databases and look at how many publications there have been on Parkinson's last year, there's over 8,000. So obviously you might get groups publishing more than one paper. But there are thousands of scientists around the world trying to find out what's going on with Parkinson's. This is nearly all basic research, um, trying to find the mechanisms, the pathways, the genetics, the modes of action of potential drugs, a massive amount of research going on. I mentioned that there were um, roughly, um, let me see, of those 291, I think roughly about half are in clinical trials. Now, in addition to the clinical trials that are going on for um, developing therapies, there are many other clinical trials which look to observe what happens with Parkinson's, to measure what happens with Parkinson's. And overall, we have 750 registered clinical trials um, for, for Parkinson's, both interventional to look at therapies to modify the progression and the symptoms of Parkinson's and observational and methodological to, do, to find better ways of measuring. And again, for reference, there are more trials ongoing for Parkinson's than for Alzheimer's, less than for diabetes, but more than for rheumatoid arthritis. So I would say in terms of, the, of our slice of the research pie, we're actually being quite well fed. So now I'd like to change tack a little, and let's, let's talk about dogfish and Gila monsters. Um, now I can't see the chat box, but um, I'll, I'll give you the answer to the first question. But meanwhile, does anybody know the collective noun for dogfish? Any answers in the chat box, Paul? Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> no, right. no, not at the moment. Yeah. Well, dogfish get their name because apparently they're hunting in packs. Uh, and the collective noun for dogfish is a troop. So you might be thinking, what has this got to do with Parkinson's? Well, a bit more about dogfish first. But from the, the uh, Squalidae family, which is not exactly the most charming of names, they can live very deeply. And they have venomous spines on each dorsal fin. So they hunt in packs and, and actually swim through swarms of smaller fish, catching them with the poisonous fins. Long gestation period. But the most interesting thing from our perspective is that the dogfish liver produces squalamine. Squalamine has been shown to prevent sticky alpha nuclear aggregation by inhibiting membrane binding. What that means is that, you remember the... Um, the, the, this this diagram from before, alpha synuclein sticking and clumping together. This usually happens when alpha synuclein is is on the in, attached to the inside of the, of the cell membrane. What squalamine seems to do is to displace alpha synuclein from the membrane, and to prevent it aggregating. So that's um, a very interesting observation. Anything that, that we can take that, to prevent alpha synuclein ag aggregation is going to be a good thing. Next, but there's a bit, bit of a problem. Squalamine doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. Now, the blood-brain barrier is a specialized system 
of epithelial cells and other cells and junctions that prevent more things from entering the brain than, than can get into other organs of the body. From an evolutionary perspective, you can understand why it developed over time. Because faced with all sorts of challenges from things that we've eaten over millennia, um, anything potentially poisonous to the brain is more serious than poisonous to other parts of the, of the body. So um, there are certain characteristics of some molecules that will cross the blood-brain barrier. But some of the most important things to test for any neurological disorder um, but squalamine doesn't cross the, the blood-brain barrier. So a research group in America working closely with um, a company called Enterin um, decided to target the enteric nervous system, um, which I'll talk to a bit more about in just a moment, and specifically looking at the symptom that happens, that occurs for a lot of people with Parkinson's, that's constipation. So this is a, uh, a schematic of how the nervous system works. You have the central nervous system with the brain and the spinal cord, then the peripheral nervous system with, I, I won't go into too much detail, but just look right at the bottom there, you have enteric, the enteric nervous system. Um, and this is sometimes being called fairly crudely the, the brain in the gut. It's, it's, it controls the op subconscious operation of, of most of the gut. Um, and as you can imagine, when something goes wrong with that, you get various problems, including constipation. So what Enterin decided to do is to test squalamine in a clinical trial for constipation. And their drug is a synthetic version of squalamine known as either ENT01 or Kenterin. They studied this in a phase two open label um, study. So an open label means that everybody in the, in the trial knew what they were taking. They were all taking uh, endo, ENTO1 or Kenterin. This, 34 people finished the, the trial. What they did was started people on a low dose, gradually increased it to a dose that, that was found to be effective, kept them on that dose for 17 days, and monitored them for 14 days further, but without taking the drug. And they found that over 80% of patients reached the primary efficacy endpoint. And I'll show you some of the results in, in the next slide. There were some side effects, and this is still an early stage drug, mild nausea uh, and diarrhea. Um, so it's gonna be about adjusting the right dose from person to person. And they've now got Kenterin in a phase two B trial, which is double blind. So the patients and the investigators don't know which therapy they're, they're taking whether it's the active ingredient or whether it's a placebo. So that we'll be able to get more reliable results and a, and a better benchmark of things like the side effects. And here's some of the results. There might be some acronyms that you haven't seen before for very good reasons. So CSBM is a complete spontaneous bowel movement. SBM is a spontaneous bowel movement. As you can see for the top one, the baseline was an average of just, just over one bowel movement a week. And for the average, for when, once people had reached their own fixed dose, was, was almost four. Spontaneous bowel movements increased, again, as you, as you can see. The use of suppositories declined significantly. Consistency was in, improved significantly. Ease of passage was improved as well. And even though quality of life number went down, the scale that they used means that the lower number is a, is a better number. And same with the patient assessment as well. So this is potentially, to me anyway, quite an exciting observation um, because it shows that something which modifies the aggregation of alpha-synuclein can act on parts of the nervous system to potentially um, show disease modification um, for, for other areas as well. Now, it might turn out that it's not acting through an alpha-synuclein, it might be working through a different mechanism. But at the very least, we, we have the potential for another treatment for par Parkinson's related constipation, which as many of you will know, often comes out very highly in surveys of, of symptoms which cause problems with quality of life in Parkinson's. There is some more good news. There's a relative of squalamine called traduscamine, which has also been shown in vitro in the lab 
to prevent aggregation of alpha, alpha synuclein. But it has the advantage that it crosses the blood brain barrier and also inhibits the interaction of the alpha synuclein oligos and fibrils as well. So, this is the, the, the Gila monster, Heloderma suspectum. Um, now, I'll give you the answer to this one. Believe it or not, the collected noun for a group of lizards is a lounge. I'm sure a lot of you have heard the phrase lounge lizard, which brings up different pictures in my mind of a, a real lizard, but there we go. Um, now, a couple of things about this lizard. Firstly, it has a poisonous bite, and it's, that poison is very dangerous to humans. That's the bad news. The good news is it has a maximum speed of one mile an hour. So if you can't get away from it, then you're not being very attentive. Now, a little word about type two diabetes and related back to the Gila monster. Resistance to insulin and lack of insulin leads to high blood sugar levels. And there's a, uh, a molecule called glucagon-like peptide one that reduces the blood sugar levels and enhances insulin release. The problem with GLP-1 itself, which is produced endogenously, is it has a very short half-life in the blood. Now the venomous saliva in the Gila monster contains a molecule called Exendin-4. It's a GLP agonist with a much longer half-life. An agonist is a molecule which actually promotes the positive activity at the receptor that you want. An antagonist is something which prevents that activity. So, in, in, in the case of, of, of diabetes and GLP-1, an agonist is a, very, is a very positive thing. And to get a very long story short, there are now six, at least six drugs, which are on the market for the treatment of type two diabetes using GLP-1 agonists. Um, and it's very, very successful, both in terms of of the, the results on health and the financial results of the pharmaceutical companies who make these products. Um, but something else very interesting has emerged over the past decade or so. That's that exenatide, which is the active ingredient in Bidurion and Bieta, is neuroprotective. That means it protects neurons from attack through various routes, whether that's exogenous or endogenous, and potentially can help to keep nerve cells alive for longer. And that's been tested in Parkinson's all the way from a phase 2A open label study to a phase 2B double blind study. Um, and now there's a phase 3 study started uh, being led by University College Hospital in London. Um, and here are some of the results from the phase 2B trial. Um, the the exenatide group are in blue and the placebo group are in, in red. So again, neither the investigators nor the patients knew which version they were taking. Um, and as you can see on, 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 on the left-hand side, there's a gradual increase in what's called the UPDRS score with the placebo. UPDRS stands for uh, Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale. And this is part three, which looks at motor um, symptoms. Part one looks at um, non-motor symptoms. Part two is inve invest uh, the the um, um, uh, quality of life, um, and then there's part four, which looks at at um, uh, uh, dys dyskinesia and off periods. Um, so, at the same time, the UPA score was going down or basically staying level for exenatide. I should also point out that the, the drug treatment lasted up to 48 weeks. And the last 12 weeks were what's called a washout period with no drug taken. And the, and the measurements made at 60 weeks. And on the right hand side, you can see what the actual difference was. So placebo continuing to go up, um, the exenatide leg st staying level basically. So this has now prompted quite a few clinical trials for GLP agonists. There's six going on for exenatide and derivatives of exenatide, and three more phase twos. 
pyroglutide, lixisinotide, and semaglutide. Now, the route of administration for these, um, except one, is injection. So people inject themselves either once a day, once a week, once a month, depending on which drug they're taking. Um, but semaglutide is an oral tablet, which has just been launched for the treatment of diabetes. And there's a, quite a large phase two trial ongoing in, in Norway with the semaglutide. So in conclusion, there's still a lot going on. Lots of new therapies, clinical trials, research, a lot of investment in Parkinson's. It's attractive for, to, to the pharmaceutical industry for a variety of reasons. Having said that, it's a tough road to travel and very expensive. Um, the, the, the field is littered with investments that companies have made in treatments that haven't come through in, in clinical trials, but there's still the will and the appetite to invest even more money. We need some more late stage drugs. Um, and also, I think we can have hope. And I'll end with a quote that I like to say, which is, we must accept finite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope. So thank you very much for your attention. Questions? No questions? Uh, I'm trying to get back to my Zoom. You try to stop sharing. Stop sharing, I think. Yeah. Ah, here we go. Go ahead. There we go. Back to you, Paul. Got you. Have we really not got any, not got any questions for Kevin? Ros, you're on mute. <laughs> Right. Now I've lost everybody. Are you there? We can hear you. Right. Has he got a treatment for mouth ulcers? For, for, sorry, for, for mouth ulcers. Uh, Bongella works well to, to relieve the symptoms. This, and and uh, it's not my area of expertise in terms of treatments to actually um, go for serious mouth ulcers, but I think there's some steroid creams that might help. Okay. Hello. Am I live? Yes, Holly. My yeah. question is, I mean, I must admit, I, I, found it, um, I found it rather difficult to keep up hope for dramatic new treatments. I've always felt that the advantage, my best hope for is uh, the improvement of existing drugs. The reduction of the side effects. I mean, I think I'm on, I'm on Cinemat, which um, is L-Dopa, of course. Mm. And um, I mean, I, I've always felt that that's, that's the way out my life is going to be improved rather than any dramatic breakthrough in drug development, which hasn't proved very effective so far. Well, that, that, that's, that's a fair comment because um, I, think, I, I, I don't want to actually decry the advantages of the existing drugs because even though they've been around for over 50 years, um, speaking personally and I know for a lot of other people, they still work ex extremely well. Now, as the disease progresses, some of the side effects become more serious. So it's still important to see, in conjunction with the symptomatic therapies, can we find therapies which slow the progress of the disease? So that some of the complications of, 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 of symptomatic treatment either don't appear later on or appear to a much lesser extent. Sure, okay, thank you. Yeah, it's Rob. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Yeah. I'd be interested to hear a bit more about how people actually get engaged in these trials. Uh, we, we often read and hear about trials that are going on and looking for people to take part. What is the selection process and how do you express interest? Um, a lot of people get into clinical trials through their specialist. Um, so that's, that's one route. Then there are a variety of websites that are available and I can, what I'll do is I'll follow up with, with Paul to give you a link to um, part of the Journal of Parkinson's Disease which has links to all of the areas where the information is there. 
Parkinson's UK have a section on the website which looks at the trials that are currently recruiting. Um, the PD trial tracker.info has a location section where you can search by location. Um, the Cure Parkinson's Trust has a section on their website which looks at clinical trials and where, where, where they're happening and what, what, what recruitment is needed. So I'll, I'll, I'll make sure that Paul has the, the, the link to the Journal of Parkinson's Disease site. Thank you. It's David. A lot of lot of the cost here you were talking about is very things is very expensive. Now, is there any way that you could advise us of where we would place our money to do the best action for research? Ooh, um, that's that's a, that's a tough one because, um, in a way, it's 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 like a horse race with. Um, a lot of horses that are running for the very first time. It's difficult to pick the winner. They all uh, are, you must have bets on them all, though. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, the owners of each of these horses are betting a lot of money on them. Um, I'm, I'm, I've got my fingers crossed for Exenotide. I'm intrigued by squalamine, which is reason for mentioning them. There are a lot of studies looking at antibody-based therapies. Um, which an anti, anti, antibody therapies are widely used in a variety of diseases, particularly in cancer. Um, and the idea is that you can use the antibody to interrupt the uh, formation of the, of the fibrils of, of alpha synuclein, or to get rid of them once they have formed. And the other thing as well is that with alpha synuclein fibrils or oligomers, there's a lot of cell to cell transmission, which is how, the, how and why the disease spreads. So the theory is that these antibody-based drugs can bind the alpha synuclein once it's ejected from the cell and prevent it going to another cell and start the whole um, domino falling again. Um, so that's the antibody therapy is one area which could either be a, a tremendous success or a dramatic failure because there've been a tremendous success in cancer but they've failed miserably with one small exception in Alzheimer's. I'm hoping we're looking for, for the cancer output rather than the Alzheimer's output. And can I just ask, um, is there any news in discovering what the prompt is for the death of neurons? I mean, it's, it's a complete mystery, isn't it, as far as I'm aware? It's, does, does, it, what, what environmental prompt? I mean, it's a gut connection, perhaps. Yeah, there's... Um, that somehow there is transmission of, um, I don't know, is it bacterial imbalance or something? And well, the... Response that the, then feeds into killing of the neurons. And again, again why, why, why is it so... Why is it this particular group of neurons that's affected? Um, well, the, the first question... There's, there's a, 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 a theory called the BRAC hypothesis, which says that it starts in the gut. It's transmitted up the vagus nerve, which is the, the main autonomic nerve coming through the middle of the body up until the, to the brain. Then, then infects the 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 the, 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 the brain, and it spreads out throughout the brain gradually, including the basal ganglia where the substantia nigra resides. Um, there's also now more evidence coming through that it could actually start in the brain and spread to the gut, spread to the rest of the body. Um, and this might not be a question of or, it might be a question of and. Mm. So with some people it might start in the gut, with other people it might start in the brain. There's also a thought that it could, it could be infected through the olfactory bulb, in, 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 which is connected to your nose. Um, and in terms of what prompts Parkinson's, well, we know that between seven and 10% of cases have a genetic component. And even that gets a bit more subtle because you might carry a mutant gene in something like LARC2 or GBA. Those are the most common ones. But you don't necessarily develop the disease. And there are cases of twins, the identical twins, which clearly have the same genetic makeup. One of the twins will develop Parkinson's and the other one won't. So it's not 
even the genetic cases are not straightforward to understand. There's also strong suspicion about environmental links. So use of pesticides, for example, use of things like trichloroethylene um, can actually, there's a lot of evidence now which tends to show that um, the, the use of those chemicals is um, very deleterious and can cause Parkinson's. Now, is it possible to say on an individual level, whether it's trichloroethylene, pesticides, some other prompt, well, it's almost impossible. Um, but we know that there's a strong link with the, the microbiome, which is the way of describing the population of friends that you have in, in your gut, bacteria, bacteria, viruses, fungi, mostly bacteria. Um, and there, there are differences in the composition of those bacteria um, in people with Parkinson's versus people without Parkinson's. Um, and there have been even some experiments done on mice grown in a sterile environment when they're actually given human gut bacteria, special mouse, mice, sorry, the, the mice were, were, were genetically engineered to develop a model of Parkinson's in the lab. But when they bred in a sterile fashion, they don't develop Parkinson's until they're actually in, infected with bacteria from people with Parkinson's. That doesn't mean to say that ba bacteria cause Parkinson's, but there's, we know that the, um, the healthier the, the profile of bacteria in, in your gut, that potentially it's better for you in terms of symptoms and symptom development. Mm -hmm. But there's a big debate over what does actually a good gut profile mean. Did that answer all, all, all of your questions? Thank you, yes. I mean, I mean it's, it, it, in the end, it comes down to we just don't know, I think. Yeah, we, we know some, some of it. We definitely don't know all of it. Yeah. And there is, a, there is a book which has just been published called Ending Parkinson's Disease. Is it good? It's good, definitely. It's, it's, it's very readable. It's written very much from a US perspective, but there's still a, an awful lot in there that's relevant. Oh, it's not by Kevin Farthing, Mick Farthing. No, unfortunately, I couldn't get a signed copy. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, if there are no more questions, I've got our chairman on Skype. And if I can get this right, I should be able to stop sharing. Um, the uh, Zoom screen with him and share the Skype, Skype screen with you. So, see if I can do this. I can't even find the button at the moment. Um, okay, can you see? I don't know what's happened here. <laughs> can you can you see Martin now on my screen? Yes. No. Yes. Okay. Yes. No. Go ahead, Martin. Let's see if we can... Oh, we can't hear him. We can't hear him. <laughs> We've got no sound. <laughs> Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> uh, you're looking for us. No, I, I can't. I can't get sound through because the sound's hooked into the the Zoom. I think we can sh we can do the video, but not the. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Kevin. Um, that's fascinating. I'm sorry we couldn't get all the people on. Uh, we will share the recording with them, and uh, I'm sure if they if they have burning questions, they'll be in touch with you. If that's all right with you. By all means, no problem at all. Okay. Yeah, thank you very well. much. Thank you all for attending. And thank you all our guests from other branches. I'm sorry we couldn't get everybody on on, but I'm not sure why it went wrong. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Mm -hmm. That's right.